Hello, my name is Daryl Robert Schoon, and I'm here once again with this wonderful, beautiful co-host of Steps Beyond Time, the founder of the Temple of Universality, Reverend Betty Tadaleski. Hello, friends. It's lovely to be with you always, either here or at the temple, and we do invite you to come see us. And, you know, now it's May. What a special month, isn't it? You know, I think we can celebrate life momentarily, every second. But sometimes we have on the calendar things that are just really special to us. So. And just a couple of weeks ago, I got an invitation uh, from a woman I have never met uh, to come help her celebrate her birthday at the recreation room of this uh, community that I live in. and. Uh, She's Catholic, and she uh, wanted, uh, just invited people to come and do the rosary with her. And I was a happy recipient of one of the invitations. I went, lots of people there, mostly I didn't know. People of all ages, children and older people. It was so lovely. She had spent three months, uh, I'm told, uh, preparing for her birthday to invite the community to come and say the rosary with her. Well, she and her friends and her large family had the most wonderful Mexican and Native American foods I've ever had. And um, it was just such a lovely experience, uh, and her heartfelt connection with the Blessed Mother Mary. Her birthday was almost in May. She gave each of us a little statue, lots of people, lots of people, of the Blessed Mother. Her cake was this large, and it had a painting on it of Our Lady of Guadalupe. She gave us uh, each a rosary, uh, the writing of the rosary, and it was one of the loveliest birthday parties I have ever been to. And uh, I just, you know, every May I think about the celebration of Mary. My mother's name was Mary. My mother was born Catholic, but she was not allowed to be raised Catholic because her mother died when she was five, uh, ten years old, and that was the end of Catholicism for her. We lived in Kentucky, and segregation at that time to us was called the separation of Baptists and Catholics. So my mama was never allowed to do that. Actually, I had a cousin who was 16 who was marrying a Catholic, and I haven't heard nor seen anything about her in all these many years. It is amazing how we ostracize, separate, and condemn people by words um, and religion. You know, it is amazing to me when the Blessed Mother's Son said, love one another as I have loved you. It's so, it's always been interesting to me how we come up with prejudice. I know it just means ignorance, uh, but isn't it amazing how it's like a a forest fire. It gets out of control. Of course, there is a lot of that going on in the world right now. Uh, when uh, we have, uh, again, it seems like we're replaying uh, Spain from the 1490s and other places, uh, uh, Africa, where we've gone to under coercion, uh, converted people. I've never understood this need to convert someone 
from their own belief system. Uh, but uh, later, my mother was pleased, of course. I became the only Catholic in a very, very large family or clan. But I love to celebrate Mary. When I became a Catholic, um, I, um, and then later, uh, spiritualism, I really, uh, to all the Catholics out here, I don't see much difference. The only difference that I can <laughs> see is that uh, those saints and sages that we used to get on the on our knees and kneel and pray, and we were saying "Maya Koopa, Maya Koopa." As a matter of fact, uh, uh, my spirit doctors, my physicians that work with me, told me that it had weakened my heart. And actually, they did a a, a heart, uh, not a transplant, but they did a lot of psychic surgery on my heart in the year 2000 after I had wandered up and down the steps of the Patala for the Buddhist Vesak festival in Tibet. So um, I have changed a bit. I have found out that the saints uh, that we pray to want to talk to us. <laughs> That's the and difference. That's the difference. Your Catholicism yeah. and most other people, yes. Betty. And that's just about the only yeah. difference that I can see is that those people are waiting to talk to us too. And as a matter of fact, uh, Saint S Sister uh, Teresa of Lisieux is standing right back here. And so, if you're very, you can ch ch uh, check your psychic ability because you might see her. Okay, um, so. Anyway, with this happening a couple of weeks ago and this wonderful opportunity that I had to do the rosary with a large community of people, none of whom I had ever met. And so I'm thinking about the Blessed Mother and me, okay? And years ago, I would say, over a dozen years ago, she came in one night. We have wonderful mediums. Um, and she said to me, Betty, I have an assignment for you. Would you consider it and uh, let me know? She said, you know, my holy sites uh, are under attack. And she reminded me that all light centers, uh, the light of God, of course, uh, are under attack always because the darkness cannot uh, wants to dispel the light. It's the same thing with the light of the mind, which is called wisdom, or simply uh, ignorance. Uh, and um, uh, and the, there's ego within us, our ego, that we're generally so proud of, wants to dispel the light uh, that is within, as Jesus calls the Holy Spirit, is within you. And so there is always in creation this duality waiting to attack you. It's a choice. It's simply a choice. And so she gave me an assignment. She said, you know, all of my holy sites are under attack. And I know that you travel the world uh, going to sacred places and um, doing uh, prayers, invoking great prayers and the ascended masters of light uh, to protect the places. Would you do this for me? So the, the list that she gave me at that time uh, were, were Fatima, Portugal, Lourdes, France, Andorra, that little place between Spain and France, um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and New Mex in Mexico, and um, Jerusalem, Cairo. A lot of people are not aware that there are many there are many Christians in Cairo, and a little church called Saint Sargas. Uh, is 
is thought to be, by many, the first Christian church because it was built, it's built over a cave in which they do believe that the baby Jesus was taken to those two years they lived in Egypt, you remember. In Palestine, in Istanbul, the Hagia Sophia, and the Roslyn Chapel in Edinburgh, Scotland. I have been thrilled with my assignment. I still um, love the assignment. You know, just tell me where to go. I'd love to go. So this month of Mary, as I said, my mother's name was Mary and Ruth, both Catholic names. But uh, w uh, Nobody talked about that. As a matter of fact, uh, there was what they would say about the Catholics, the few Catholics that we had in, in my hometown, were that, was that they prayed the statues. Well, you know, often our litany is, don't bother me with facts. That seems to go on. It's pretty prevalent around the world. Don't bother me to tell me that there's some good Muslims out there and some good Japanese and Koreans and, you know. I'd rather not know about that uh, because you seem to put them in the same category as Christians, okay? Well, we're universalist, um, you know, and the, uh, everybody has a right to worship the God in any way they want, like we are uh, not admonished, but we are reminded that it would behoove us all, uh, as time gets more interesting, I would say, <laughs> with floods and droughts. And have you been reading the paper lately? I mean, just sinkholes are just appearing, you know? It has, just this past week, it's been real interesting and very sad, it saddened me about the things that are happening that we, uh, that we really didn't expect. How could it happen this way? <clears throat> but Daryl and I want to talk about a man, Franz Werfel. I'm going to let you talk about him. It's an amazing story. There's a book that um, you may know about called The Song of Bernadette. And the story of how that book came to be written is the story of what happened to Franz Werfel. He was, a, uh, he was Jewish, and he was a writer and politically active. And this was in the 1940s when Hitler was at its power. And, pa and Paris had just And Paris fallen. had fallen, all right? And Franz Werfel, I think he was Austrian. He he left, and he was trying to get to the West, all right, for safety. Trying to get over to Spain. That's yes, the only, only way. way he could do it. So he ended up in the southwest of France, all right, and um, he he writes this story of how it happened to him. He wasn't looking to go to Lourdes. He said what happened was was that ca cars were running out of gas. All right, people had taken all their possessions. There were thousands of people trying to get away from the... They, they believed there were millions because Paris had just fallen. fallen. So people just headed out of there. They knew, I mean, there was enough stories about what the Nazis there, were up to. There was to. no way to get into the water. Yes. Unless they went over the, France and, and over, the, over the Pyrenees, over the Spain, to get, to get to the ocean and hopefully book passage somewhere else. So here was this a writer, Franz Werfel, an intellectual, a political activist, whose views about Hitler were well known, not only to other people, but to Hitler. And he was on the top of the hit. <laughs> he was on the top of the list, all right? And in fact, he said at the time, there were reports circulating that he had been captured and killed. And this was the best thing could have happened. Yeah, he said it gave him sort of cover, all right? That, that, but he knew there was still after, and right. if they found him, it, w it was, it was, it was it. That was it. And so he said he was there that night with his family, thousands of people, cars by the side of the road. People were walking, and there was no place to stay. There was no place to rest your head. No it was food. No food. Nothing. And he said he talked to somebody, and somebody said, well, you know what? There is a town 
up, and he pointed up this other little About road. 80 miles away. Yeah, 80 miles away, Lourdes. And there may be a place for you to find refuge <coughs> there. Because it's called a place of miracles. Yes. And so Franz Werfel took his family and they made their way to this little town. Now, here he was. It doesn't take much to understand the duress that he was under. His life was at stake. And it hung in the balance of what was going to happen to him. He was Jewish, which made it all the more so. And he found himself in this little town where miracles happened. And what happened to him there? And what he found out about this town of Lourdes. And the miracle that why people flocked to Lourdes for those miracles so moved him that he said, if I make it through this, if this, if I can get through this, I want to write the story <coughs> of Bernadette. I will sing a song. Yes. To Bernadette. To Bernadette. This young woman who, around which the miracle of Lord, what, I mean, all of us have heard about Lords. 1858. Yes. That you go there for the <coughs> healing waters. But the truth is, there's a story connected to those healing waters. Lourdes was just another village in the, at the base of the Pyrenees in France. There was nothing special about it until this Bernadette, who was born in a very, very poor family. was She had no money. In fact, she left her house. She had to go live with the nuns. All right. And what happened to her just transformed this town. People didn't believe her. I mean, it's sort of like whenever we talk about God, we've got God in a box in a fairy tale that happened back then to somebody else. And what we do is we read the fairy tale and we believe it to our degree of wanting to believe it. But as far as anything happening around us or saying that people have talked to God or been visited by love or whatever, we dismiss it. It's somehow an infringement on the story that we choose to believe. And so when Bernadette, as a young girl, had these visitations, had the mother, had these things happen to her, it was not met with awe and wonder by the village people no. saying, oh, what a lucky girl. She, the, she's got this visitation. She's been touched by God. It was met with derision, with, with chastisement, with punishment, and yet she wouldn't give it up. Why? Because she knew it was real. The reason why people are going to Lourdes today and have ever since Bernadette received this from the mother is because of what happened to her. And now people believe it. She's venerated. It's acknowledged. But the birth of that miracle came through much difficulty and disbelief. As much as things today, when people you receive gifts of love or, or stories about the Holy Spirit, are just dismissed out of hand with that same ignorant holding on to this could not be. Right. So... This well, is... I certainly never heard the story when I was uh, yeah. growing up. Uh, but uh, when she told me the second place, I, third place I went was Lourdes. And um, it is a, a magical place, mystical place. And unlike most places where there are six million people a year uh, go, um, uh, there were not uh, stands of of things for sale. Uh, they made uh, the water was free. Now you remember the story, the impossible story of how this water happened to be. She and a couple of girlfriends were her cousins were sent to gather wood. People, <laughs> we're talking about real poverty, okay. They lived, their home was a, a, a j cell of a jail, a jail. Yeah, the father was disgraced. Yeah. So they had, he lived, you know, he just was, it was bare survival. Right. So she and a cousin and a friend went to get the water <clears throat> and, uh, and get some sticks for the fire. They crossed a little stream up to their ankles. And, and went over to gather firewood. While her cousin and a friend were doing this, uh, she 
kneels down to do the rosary and she sees a little lady sitting on, standing on a branch. <laughs> the the uh, friend and, and her cousin did not see it and she didn't say much, but the little lady said to her, kneel down and say the rosary. Little uh, Bernadette was not uh, educated. As a matter of fact, I think she was 14 and tall for her age and, and pretty much totally ignorant because she had asthma so bad that she was rarely in church or in school. Uh, but while they're gone, this little lady standing on a limb has talked to her, and so she does this. The little lady tells her, uh, come back every day and uh, say the rosary. That was the beginning of much uh, coercion, torture, misery for her. In the village? In the village, in the village and across uh, France. Yeah. You know, one thing, you know, miracles do happen. Expect a miracle. If, if things are awful for you, do expect a miracle. You do often get what you expect. It just happened that the King of France, that a lot of people don't know this, but in his book he talks about it, uh, Franz Werfel. <clears throat> uh, the king had one son and he was very ill and the doctors could do nothing for him. And she heard about lords and the water. And people even in the um, court, women in the court were saying they had heard of this water uh, from the lords, that little town, little village. And uh, somebody brought her water and the king did not want her to let her, his only son, only child, to drink the water, but she did anyway. The baby was healed, the boy was healed overnight. So uh, that had a lot to do with it. People around the town changed their minds and so forth. Because the king was involved. Because the king. <laughs> now, now what, what are the chances of the king being involved when she's being vilified? Vilified, okay. But anyway, it yeah. happens. and. So, uh, when I was there, I, I, it, was in, it, it is an incredibly beautiful and wonderful and miraculous place. But what surprised me too was that um, uh, the prices were not exorbitant. <coughs> All the water was free. <coughs> you could buy a, a big jug and bring water as much as you could carry. At that time I went, uh, you were able to take water on the plane. So <clears throat> now if I, we could not. But I did bring half a gallon for the church for healing. Um, and I'm thrilled I went when I did. But, <clears throat> you know, we need role models. And, and the Blessed Mother is a very good one. You know, in all of these places that I've traveled <clears throat> and built what we call golden pyramids over all of these sacred uh, places, um, it's so simple. The best things in life are either free or very reasonable. The magical water from Lourdes is free and you can have as much as you can carry. They have these long uh, pipe from here, longer than this room, with faucets on them every couple of feet for this water. But you remember that there was no water there. She, when, the, when the Blessed Mother told her, wash your face, there was nothing but sand. She picked up the sand and scrubbed her face till it bled. And until, then the water came, until the water came. Ladies and gentlemen, 11 o'clock every Sunday at the Temple of Universality, Country Club and Prince at the Masonic Temple, Reverend Betty Kavaleski. There's more, there's more, there's more. There's always